Tony here with the Jeep Talk Show, and this is our interview episode. We have interviews every Friday, and I certainly hope your Friday is going very well today. Um, so today we're going to have a great interview, so just stand by, and uh, we'll get it going here in just a second. From around the world, or from your city, and sometimes just down the street. How to neighbor. It's the Jeep Talk Show interview. All right, hill boys and girls, we're here for another Jeep Talk Show interview. We're going to be talking with David. Uh, David is, has always been interested in Jeeps while in college and in late the in the late 1990s. He was able to buy his first Jeep, and listen to this, guys, a 1990 Jeep Cherokee. He started learning and exploring with that. After that, uh, was totaled in an accident. We're going to talk about that, David. Uh, he then bought a 1984 CJ7, and his life changed forever. David was born with a very rare uh, uh, peripheral neuropathy, neuropathy. Say that for me. Neuropathy. You, you've been, peripheral neuropathy. You've been saying it for a long time, so I'll, I'll just go with you. I can't pronunciate anything, so there you go. Uh, which yeah. has affected his ability to be, uh, be able to get around, so his disability has progressed over the years. His Jeep has literally become his replacement for his legs, allowing him to uh, be able to get out and explore the areas of the world that he would otherwise be inaccessible to him. David has been deeply ingrained in the Jeep community for almost 30 years. He lived in Moab for 14 years. Oh, you poor bastard. Uh, where he, he was one of the organizers and planners for Easter Jeep Safari. Uh, he also was the land use officer for Red Rock Four Wheelers for 13 years and helped to preserve and protect the trails around Moab. He now lives literally right next door to Sand Hollow in Hurricane, Utah. David's passion and love for the Jeeps uh, is truly remarkable. He currently owns eight older Jeeps or Willys uh, or Willis. Is it Willys or Willis? I say Willys. It's debatable, but I say Willys. I tell everybody uh, if you if you're if you're trying to remember, just say uh, what you talking about, Willis. So <laughs> at least one from every decade from the 1940s through the 1990s. He, he is passionate about the older stuff. He's also a collector of Jeep memorabilia uh, and currently has the world's most complete Jeep grill collection. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see some of those right behind him right now. Uh, he has a grill from every model of Jeep made from 1941 to 2021, 65 grills total. Uh, he also has a tailgate collection with tailgates from 18 different models of Jeeps. Uh, all uh, of this stuff is hanging in the garage, which he is turning into a Jeep museum. So you you must have a Comanche uh, tailgate in there somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. Those, those are cool. Yeah. So I was telling you about Chuck and how he has a like a CJ7 that he's made into a desk for his office, and I give him shit every time I see it because <laughs> that's taking the life away from. I mean, it's not like a tailgate or a grill; it's like the whole front end of a Jeep. So, the, what do you think about uh, like these trophies that you put up on the wall, where the Jeep could be living its life out on the trail? You know, to me, I, I've had people kind of give me a hard time of, "Oh, you should take that you know, off the wall and put it on a vehicle," but. There's more grills out there than there are complete vehicles. There just are. And I figure, you know, what I've got here with all of these is literally it's the history of, of Jeep. It's, it's what they've done. I mean, there's no vehicles that has the iconic front end like the Jeep does. You can go to anywhere in the world and almost everybody's going to recognize that traditional seven-slot Jeep grill. So what I'm doing is trying to preserve those history. And you see a lot of these grills up here, they're beat up, they're danged up, they've got rust or they're bent. And I had somebody say, well, are you going to go through and restore them? No, I, I'm not, because they're going through and they're preserving the history of what that vehicle went through. Yeah, what it ex it's part of the story. It's part of the story of the, the part. Exactly. And in a lot of these, especially for my really rare pieces, I intentionally wanted the grills that were beat up because then they couldn't go back on a vehicle. So then I don't feel bad about taking them from a really rare vehicle. Ah, I got, okay. So you do feel bad about the about putting these things up off of Jeeps. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just trying to preserve that history. Well, that's cool. And, yeah, and of course, they're yours. You should do whatever you want to with it. Uh, but, uh, you know, the Jeep community, they're going to give you a hard time about something. they gotta, they got to find out where your, where your sensitivities are. <laughs> yeah, that's what we just Jeep pursue. If we don't rats you, we don't like you. That's right. So uh, the 1990 Jeep Cherokee. Uh, now, I have a 1998 uh, Cherokee. was my first Jeep. Uh, we got it uh, brand new in 97. And actually, I drove it uh, as my daily driver for a good 23 years, I believe. 
uh, before I got right. a 2021 Gladiator, but the, the, the Cherokee is still there. And anytime I took the Cherokee to uh, an event or something where people would walk by and look at it, so many people would say, Oh, I used I, this was my first Jeep. I had one just like this. And then I said, Well, what happened to it? I sold it. I said, Up, oh, you should never have sold it. He goes, I know, I know, I should never have sold it. But you didn't sell yeah. yours. Or well, maybe you did. Maybe it was a part out or a, a haul to the, the junkyard. So in your intro, it says that it was totaled. Tell me what happened. Yeah. So I was actually driving, um, getting ready to go to a work Christmas party. And I was driving down the, the road going, you know, 50 miles an hour, and a lady pulled down in front of me. Oh, no. I T-boned her and totaled my vehicle, totaled her vehicle, everything. And, you know, I just put a brand-new lift on it. I was so excited because I got my first set of off-road tires. There were a set of lift this, Tony, 30 by 950. Uh, they were, yeah. I was pretty badass at that point. I mean, I mean, this was back in 1998, you know, where... 33 inch tires were huge. 35s were unheard of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I thought it was pretty cool with my 30 inch off road tires. And uh, so I ended up buying it back and then sold it to somebody else who said he was going to put it on a frame rack and try to get it fixed back up. And I don't know if that ever happened, but I took that money and I bought my CJ7, which I've now had for over 25 years. So from the intro, it seems like that you uh, very much like the CJ7 more so than the Cherokee. And I would assume not just because it was totaled, but because there was something about it that really spoke to you. Yeah. And I actually, and I talked a little bit about this, I think, in my intro, but I actually just finished writing a book that I just published on Amazon this week. And in that, I talked about kind of my story of how I fell in love with it, with the Jeep. And I, I remember when I was a little boy, I had a paper route. And I was going around to this apartment complex. This would have been probably about 1985. And I remember coming around a corner and seeing the CJ7, which at that point would have been a brand new Jeep. It was a, the, that chocolate brown color. And I know now that it was a Renegade because it had the yellow, oh, you know, yeah. pin. A proper, on it. a proper Renegade, not one of the yes. new ones. <laughs> right. I just remember there was something innate about that vehicle that I just thought, that's the vehicle that I want when I get older. And I just fell in love with that idea of a CJ7. And then funny enough, about 10 years later, my dad became an office manager at a Jeep dealership. And so, you know, that was when the YJ came out and everybody was making fun of that, you know, square headlighted bastard and blah, 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 blah. And then the TJ got introduced in 96, which is right about the time I was looking at getting a vehicle. So I was really trying to convince my parents to help me get a TJ and they wouldn't put out that much money. And so we ended up getting this Cherokee which was better than nothing. And then when that got totaled and I got some good insurance money, I finally used that to buy my CJ7 that I'd wanted since I was a little kid. Yeah. So uh, I I think I, uh, I've, I've been interested in Jeeps, as, as I think most people are. Uh, maybe not buying one, but they find them interesting. Uh, and also, too, you know, this is the military history behind them. Uh, but anyway, right. I, I got interested in uh, getting a Jeep. I think I was 17 or 18 years old. Uh, which in retrospect, it would have been a CJ, probably a CJ7, because it was around 78, I think, when I was uh, just checking into it. And they were very expensive uh, as far as uh, to, to other vehicles. And then I checked the, uh, I actually went as far as checking what insurance would cost. And it was going to cost me $75 a month for insurance. And that was way more than what I could afford. So that oh, kind of... Yeah, that kind of squashed my uh, my Jeep ambitions. So I didn't get back to it until uh, like '97, I think, where I went and looked at a a, a TJ. Uh, and uh-huh. uh, but uh, and I was I, I actually was picking all the right stuff: standard transmission. Um, I think it had the the Dana 30 front, Dana 44 rear. Uh, I don't know for sure. Maybe it was a 35. I hope to God not. But anyway, uh, it was. Right. I, I took the wife up there to to get her to you know show it to her instead of just driving home with it. <laughs> and uh, we saw the Cherokee, bright red four door Cherokee. Our girls were three and four years old, so uh, we loved the color uh, of the the Cherokee. And uh, I said, well, let's just get that one. That way, we have a place where the girls can ride the back, and it'll just be easier. We can always get a TJ later. And uh, yeah. we didn't get a TJ for a long time. 
And then we finally got one, and that's what my wife drives is a TJ. So, uh, yeah, the TJs were really, really cool. Uh, and I, I learned after that about the YJs and the CJs. Uh, we have quite a few listeners that are big into the CJs and have a, a collection, not as big as yours, but a, a collection of Jeeps. And I mentioned Chuck earlier. He's very much the old older Jeep uh, uh, character on our show, and um, even though he's much younger than I am. And uh, it, he has a, a large collection of uh, flat fenders and uh, so on and so forth at his ranch. Uh, in uh, in Kansas, so yeah, uh, he'll be he'll be really excited about this interview. Yes. All right. So uh, that's really cool, though. Too. Uh, so let me ask you about the, this uh, genetic disorder that you have. Uh, so you were doing a paper route. How were you able to do the paper route? Was it the the, the disease had not uh, progressed as far, or right? So basically, it's a slowly degenerative disorder because as the nerves get more damaged, they're able to function less and less as you get older. Because in our body, nerves are weird. They're one of the only cells in our body that doesn't regenerate. Right. Once a nerve is damaged, it doesn't fix itself, which is why spinal cord injuries and neuropathy is such a major thing, because there's no getting better from that, really. Um, and so when I was younger, you know, I was able to walk around. I was able to ride a bike. I could never run. I could never jump. I could never do a lot of those type of things. But I could walk around pretty well. I mean, I walked strangely. You know, oftentimes I was accused of being drunk or something like that because I would kind of wander as I walked. Right. Yeah, what I would do back then is instead of riding a bike, is I actually had a little red wagon. So I would pack up all my newspapers, I'd put them in my little red wagon, and then I would drag the wagon around behind me and I would throw the papers up onto the the, the steps for where, you know, the going into the apartments. So that's why I did that for about a year and a half. That's really cool. I actually did a paper route with my mom, but we were driving around in a 65 red Mustang throwing papers. Uh, and nice. uh, but, but I was just thinking, this is something that a lot of kids are not going to have the ability to do because newspapers just aren't a thing anymore. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's uh, America, you know, USA, where a kid's on a paper route with his bike or little red wagon or whatever. So it, it was, I think that's really cool that you had that ability to, to get out there and do that and, and have a memory of it. And I'm, I know all the memories weren't great, but still, it's, uh, it's cool. It was an accomplishment. So uh, that's really it was like a, I think for our generation is everybody had a paper route. It was just kind of what you did as a kid. Yeah. And you're right. Kids these days would have no idea what that even means. Yeah, uh, paper route, and I did that with my mom, and then of course I did uh, uh, mowed law lawns uh, for uh, in buying bicycles or electronic right. components and stuff. So yeah, uh, I think grass still grows, and there's nobody doing that yet, except some of the robots. So that's going to be taken over soon with the uh, the AI robots. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, we talked a little bit about this before we started the interview. Uh, Greg Henderson of Unofficial Use Only is working on a vehicle for you. Uh, can you, get, I mean, feel free to tell me everything you told me before. Uh, that's, that's the downside about having a conversation before the interview. It was a lot of good information. So let's start with what it is. Talking a little bit. So a few years ago, I was down at the FC Roundup, which was held down in Phoenix, Arizona, by an awesome guy named Jesse Ibarra. And he was a, he's a huge FC fan. Fanatic, you know, the FC-150, FC-170, you know, the military version, the M676, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, so we went down there. I went down there with one of my friends. And lo and behold, we went to his backyard, and I see these three vans. I'd never seen anything like it before. So I started talking to Jesse, and he was telling me a little bit about them. And what they are is they're a Jeep fleet van. And uh, they originally were built between 61 and 65 as a postal delivery van. And essentially what the government had done is they came to, to Willie's at that time and they said, hey, we would like you to create this van for us. And so at that time, Jeep or Willie's, whatever you want to call them at that time, was currently making the DJ3A. So it was already a two-wheel drive vehicle for the most part and a right-hand vehicle, right-hand drive vehicle for the most part. So Willie's took that finished chassis with the drivetrain motor, everything, and sent it to a company called the Highway Corporation. They're somewhere in Pennsylvania. I don't remember where. And they basically took a van body and dropped it on top of this um, DJ3A chassis. And so it's got the exact same components as most of the early CJs. Got an 80-inch wheelbase. You know, the track width is about five feet wide. You know, just these little itty-bitty boxes. And then the original, what they called the FJ3, is what they were called. Because like the DJ3, these were the FJ3. Um, they were right-hand drive, and you stood up to drive them. So they were a really unique vehicle. Because you stood up to drive them, you had a steering wheel almost like a bus, uh, because the windshield is right here. It's a forward control. The motor would be sitting right next to you. 
And then the gas pedal, you went up and down with, with your left foot while you were standing there. And then on the right-hand side, you all had like a little spoon that came out. And you would just kind of turn your foot sideways to give it gas. And then the postman would just step out, put the mail in the box, and away he would go. And so they made about 11,000 of these between 61 and 65. And like it's so often the contract with the government is they say, okay, when the, the service side of these vehicles are done, they have to be destroyed. You know, like with the Humvee, like some of the other military vehicles, that was a concept for a long time. Well, especially these, because not only were they right and drive, but you also stood up to drive them. And so the 11,000 that were made for the post office, it would surprise me if there were a couple hundred left. Mm-hmm. And of those couple hundred, I'd be surprised if there were more than 20 or 30 of them even on the road today. And so, long story short, which you'll find, Tony, I'm not very good at, but I was able to talk <laughs> Jesse out of one of these fleet vans with the idea of making it into a handicap conversion van for me. He'd already swapped the motor, the transmission, so it wasn't original, so I didn't feel bad cutting up an original. And then I got talking to Greg, who I've known for years and years and years, you know, from Jeep Safari and some other things, and he came up with this great idea because he had a connection with Roxer. And we were looking at maybe putting in, you know, a Cummins 2.8, but just a Cummins 2.8 motor was almost eight grand. Wow. No transmission, no axles, no frame, no anything, just the motor. And through Greg's connections, he was able to give me a really good deal on the entire Roxer, minus some of the things that I didn't need, like a windshield and a roll cage and seats and stuff like that, for about $11,000. And so Greg bought that Roxer, took the body off it, Took my body off my old chassis, literally had to cut down that Roxer body 16 inches for the frame, excuse me. Wow. I, mean, I, think, are, I think they are a 98 inch wheelbase, 97 inch wheelbase, and we had to make it right about 80 inches. Mm-hmm. So we cut 16 inches out of that Roxer frame to be able to drop my fleet van body down on it. So Greg finished all that work up just a little while ago. And then just last weekend, we shipped out here to Utah to one of my buddies that owns a mobility company. And he's going to be putting in the ramp. He's going to be getting the seat so that it'll work for me, getting the whole interior finished. And then when that's done, we're going to get it painted. And then the hope is that we'll be able to enter it into SEMA, into the Battle of the Builders this year, because it's such a unique build and a yes. unique view. I was very impressed with just the size of the thing, because it's tiny. And I was thinking, and I had never seen it before. So I, uh, so I, t- I told you, I saw it in a Zoom meeting because we do roundtables and Greg will join us and he'll he'll be working on his stuff. And then, you know, yeah. you got to ask him questions about what the hell's that, Greg? <laughs> Is yeah. that a Jeep? You know, all kinds of stuff. And uh, yeah. so I think that's a great idea. And it would, I'm sure it would garner a lot of attention uh, at SEMA. So uh, and, unless you want to keep it a secret, what kind of uh, paint color are you going to go with? Because I, I, gave, I gave Greg several suggestions. <laughs> Yeah, so I've always been a green fan. My my Jeep has been green with a bright yellow roll cage for years. So green has always kind of been my go-to choice. So I'm actually going with a 2018 Mojito. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. So so for the windshield and stuff, is that something that needed to be replaced? And I would imagine that's kind of hard to find. It's got a couple of the side windows on it, but a lot of the rest of the glass is going to have to be replaced. Yeah, I would think that it would uh, not not actually get foggy, but not be pristine, uh, clear looking. And and obviously, yeah. if you're going to be standing there, and, and you're going to be standing in it, driving it, right? Sitting down. So we're converting it into a left-hand drive. Before oh, okay. I got it, it was the process of being made into left-hand. We looked at the possibility of keeping it right-hand drive to keep that history of the, the original van being right-hand drive. Because Roxer makes a right-hand drive version. But at that time, it was right when all of the COVID crap was going on, and it was so hard to get parts. And we would have had to have gotten a new intake manifold, a new exhaust manifold, um, moved the steering, of course, all over to make it right-hand drive, repositioned the turbo, and a couple other things. And Greg's like, if we order these parts, it may take a year to get them in, if we even get them in. Right, And so at that point, it was easier to just make it left-hand drive, and I will have a seat that'll be be in it. We'll probably take something like a sprinter band seat that'll pivot, you know, 360 degrees. Uh, yes. In it, and then pivot around and get in position to be able to then drive it. 
So I don't know what it's called, but it's really cool because it's on tracks. I, I saw a picture, I think it was on your Instagram, where yep. you're on a tracked, uh, a, a tracked vehicle type thing where it's a one-person thing. Although I guess you could take passengers, but you were standing straight up in that. Uh-huh. Is that exactly. something? Is that something that yep. you would use for for getting in this this van, or are you like standard wheelchair type thing? Well, either one. So I've got a scooter that I use on my day to day, you know, transportation because that works better for me. Um, so I could either drive my scooter up into the back, or hopefully you'll be able to make it so I can drive my track chair up into the back. Either one. Yeah, that track chair that's got to be handy for off road stuff. Uh, do you get a little concerned about off camber? <laughs> Yeah, like the rest of us do. <laughs> Not bad because it's got it's got these big, huge car batteries in it, and so the weight is ah, all down. Yeah, and so it works pretty good, and it'll go just about up anything. I mean, I've even taken it up a couple of stairs at like some of the national parks and stuff, and it it really does pretty good. Oh, I'm it's jealous. Fine. I was walking around at EJS going to look at dinosaur bones and I was uh, not, uh, I- I'm sitting down most of all the time. So I was not sure footed walking down those trails and uh, in the sand and the shelves that uh, the rock shelves. Right. And uh, yep. yeah, I- I'm a little jealous. I need one of those track vehicles. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah, It's made by called action track chair and they're actually out of Minnesota. And um, a few years ago, I- I'm sure you're familiar with the name Randy Rod. You know, he does Jimmy's 4x4 out in Cortez. Um, he's done some work for me on my vehicle before, and his wife at the time, Cotton, actually learned about these track chairs. And she's like, these would be perfect for some of the disabled vets that go to, like, King of the Hammers and can't yes. get around. Yes, The distributor. So I actually bought mine through Cotton. Um, and my ex-wife, who, you know, I was married to at the time, she set up a GoFundMe page. And this was right before EJS, and I believe it was 2016. And within about eight weeks between Jeep Safari and then the GoFundMe page, um, Jeepers donated over $18,000 for me to be able to buy this track chair. So it was a very humbling experience and very much appreciated. So I'll do a little bit of bragging here, talk about humbling experience. We had 23 Jeep Talk Show team members and listeners uh, come out. Uh, to join us at EJS this year. And that's a oh, very, cool. very humbling experience to, you know, start a show and have that much, that many people uh, trek out to, to Utah and just be, be there with us. I mean, Utah has a bit of a draw by itself, but still. Um, <laughs> so that is really, really cool. And then that was, that's just a, a great chair and, and having the, uh, letting the, the, the veterans get out there off road too, can just be, must be a, a wonderful freeing experience. I'm, I'm sure it's, that's the, one of the things that you like about it because you're out yeah. there experiencing things that, uh, people with, uh, pro- properly functioning bodies don't even do. Right. And, and it's amazing. The, the, the liberty that gives you and the independence it gives you to all of a sudden be able to go wherever you want. Because, you know, for those of us that rely on some type of mobility equipment, a wheelchair or a scooter or a walker or whatever, the concept of going down to the beach in sand or to go anywhere off of payment, it, it just doesn't exist in our world. We just can't do it. But all of a sudden, when you have something like the track chair, it opens up the world to you again. And allows me, I mean, literally, I could go just about anywhere. I've gone down to the beach. I can go up to eight inches of water. I can go through snow. I can go over rocks. I mean, I've been able to go places that I otherwise just would not be able to access. Mm-hmm. And so it's really been life-changing. And one that we had actually they enabled me to be able to stand up, which is such a novel concept. You don't think about how much it affects your self-esteem and self-respect when you can look somebody in the eye. Right. Because when you're looking up at everybody, and then all of a sudden you can stand up and be on their level, it's amazing. Well, I, I've never I've never met a short person I didn't tease. So, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, it is very important to look, to look at people uh, eye to eye, and even if it isn't uh, important to the person uh, that is standing above you, there's always a bit of subservience to that you know, being lower than everybody else. So no, I think that's a great thing. And I thought about that whenever I first saw these, uh, these, uh, devices that allow you to stand up and move around. Uh, although I was a little concerned about tipping over because I guess this is my concern. You know, I'm, I'm very clumsy. I've been clumsy my entire life. I remember, uh, at, at mom and dad's house, I'd just be standing flat footed and all of a sudden, boom, I'd be on the floor and I'd hear this. Are you all right? Yeah, I just fell down. I'm fine. <laughs> Don't know why, just, you know, and just not having the ability to easily get up on my own would be terrifying. It is. 
It really is. And I, I found as I've gotten older, the ground is not nearly as soft as it used to oh, be. God, yes. I'll bounce as well as I used to. So, yeah, I do my best not to be on the ground unless I can help it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you've had a long a long time to learn how to handle this stuff uh, and work right. through it. So, But it, I, I, like I told you before we started, it's just an amazing thing that you're just uh, out there uh, uh, going and doing. And uh, and I'll mention this for the, for the audience. Uh, I think one of the things we're here for is to learn how to handle fear. And that's, that's what you've done. That's what I try to do. And that's what everybody should do is, is handle that fear, work through it. Don't uh, over, uh, over exaggerate the situation. Uh, everybody team seems to go very negative, like things that bad things can happen. And uh, <laughs> I was like my wife, I wanted her to go to EGS with me this year. I went for the first time last year and she was so concerned because she doesn't like heights. And um, mm. we we actually got it there. It was my fault. We kind of uh, we were going to Long Canyon. That's a nice, safe place to take somebody. Right. You know, there's not much that you know can go wrong there, or, or, or uh, the the appearance of going wrong. And uh, yeah. I got lost, and we came up Schaefer's Trail, and <laughs> she, <laughs> she was not a happy camper. I thought it was just amazing being able to see the little trail and the eighth inch uh, the wide jeeps on that trail that we had come up. And then she actually saw one of the Jeeps up on uh, on the, the switchbacks, and she goes, are we going up there? I'd never been there before. I didn't know. I said, I, I don't know. We could be. <laughs> That's fun. And even yeah. better, it started yeah, we, snowing while we were up there. <laughs> uh, when I first moved to Moab, I had a job where I was a tour driver, and I actually went up Schaefer Trail every single day. Mm -hmm. I would go up Schaefer Trail and down Long Canyon, driving a nine-passenger Ford excursion. <laughs> oh, my and, God. And, I mean... Every time you'd have to pass somebody on the way up. Yeah. So I probably went up Schaefer Trail hundreds of times. And oh yeah, love it. But it it's it's one of those things. I remember the first time I saw it, I'm like, that's a dead end. There is no way there's a road that goes to the top of that canyon. Yeah. And then you just start zipping your way up and it climbs well, twelve hundred feet in about a mile. Okay, good. I, I knew that it was over a thousand, but I was actually saying maybe two thousand feet because it it's it's so high. It's wonderful. It was it was so cool, and the view was was as you can as you can imagine, as you know, is wonderful. I highly recommend it. Just don't take somebody that's afraid of uh, afraid of heights. I, the wounds in my arm are still uh, <laughs> the fingernails in my arm are still healing. <laughs> so when I'd be driving, I'd have some people literally that would be sitting in the excursion, and as I go around each switchback, they would go to they move over to the other side of the vehicle, so they could always be on the inside, away from the edge. My wife would so, say, uh, she goes get. Get away from the edge. You're too close to the edge. And I was trying to get, get her before she could get, get a good shot because even though she was scared, she was still working the camera for video. But she just wouldn't look at the camera. She couldn't look down. So I told her, I said, if you want to, get in the back seat behind me. <laughs> be further away from the edge. And she started yeah. laughing because it's ridiculous. If you're going over, it doesn't matter what side of the, the vehicle you're on. <laughs> it does. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, so it was it was interesting. We we did make it to Long Canyon, but not on that trip of uh, uh, that uh, that outing. And we had just done. I mean, we drove uh, through Potash, and we went around the long way, and uh, mm -hmm. we just went and had lunch. And uh, but we we got back out there on Friday, I think it was, and uh, took her on that and went in the the right way, at least according to Trails Off Road, where the the it, it, the other entrance, uh, the proper yeah. entrance. And uh, she, we're going down, and they have a not. I wouldn't call it a switchback, but you know, it's kind of a narrow trail, and you have to go down uh, a distance. And she said, uh, "You know, if we hadn't done that other trail, this would have been scary to me." But now it wasn't scary, so she improved. Yeah. You know, by doing it, she learned she was going to live. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, long canyon after doing Schaefer, it's no big deal. Oh yeah, yeah. no, it, it's it's great. It's a, it, and I figured it was a nice stable trail, and I kept telling her, "Hey, I had no plans on taking you up Schaefer's trail." Uh, but it would have been a long drive if we had turned around and went back, and it all worked out. So uh, it's like that that the thing that you see on the dashes of uh, on the memes. Of, but did you die? You didn't, and you had an adventure. <laughs> yep. And, and I think you know, like you said before, I think that's part of what life is. Life is about making memories, and life's about pushing yourself, and life's about new experiences. And you know, I look for every opportunity that I can not do something new because how do you know whether you like something if you never try it? So I'm right. I'm all trying to do new things because i think that's why we're here to go out and do and to live our lives well going back to the whole fear thing if you're not challenging yourself and to learn how to deal with fear uh but and quite often the excitement is is that i did that i succeeded 
and I'm still here and now I can do more. So let me ask you something, talking about Easter Jeep Safari, um, I've only been to Easter Jeep Safari twice, and in both occasions, I didn't do anything with uh, the Red Rock four-wheelers. And since you've been a part of that, I'd like to understand better what Red Rock four-wheelers do, because uh, we, we really can't talk about it here on the show since I have no experience with them. Now, they're the reason for Easter Jeep Safari, my, is my understanding. Yes. Yeah, so Jeep Safari started in 1967 by the Moab Chamber of Commerce. Um, during the late 60s and early 70s, it really when kind of the heyday of the uranium mining period was starting to go downhill. And so they were trying to look for ways, the Chamber of Commerce, to try to draw some attention to the area. And so they set up this Easter Jeep Safari thing where it was the, the first or the Saturday right before Easter of every year. Um, it was only one day. That's why Big Saturday is Big Saturday, because it was the original day. And then as it went on, a couple years later, they added another day and another day and another day. And by the late um, 70s and early 80s, it was starting to get pretty big. And they're getting to the point that the BLM was getting more and more involved in things. And so the BLM was going to make them start getting a permit and they were getting insurance. And that wasn't something the Chamber of Commerce really wanted to continue. And so in 1982, the Red Rock four-wheelers were founded basically with the idea of them running Easter Jeep Safari. And so from 1982 forward, Easter Jeep Safari was run by the Red Rock four-wheelers, and they took that over. And so it's been an amazing event in terms of what's been able to accomplish for not only the jeeping community, but the jeeping world, but Moab, Southern Utah, rock crawling, the, the whole thing. And it's just, it's an iconic event that I truly believe that everybody needs to go to at least once. I agree crazy it's hectic it's overpriced getting into restaurants stupid finding a hotel is ridiculous it costs way more than it should but the experience of being there is something that if you're in the off-road world it's like the equivalent of sturgis for motorcycles you know it's one of those things you just need to go to at least once Mm -hmm. Uh, i had so much fun last year and and i'll say this again it was largely due to the the jeep talk show folks uh, that were there. Cause you know, when you experience something, it's always better to experience with friends. And I got to meet several of them since this is a, a, an online type thing. I got to meet uh, several of them that I had never met before. And then uh, this year it was even more people. Uh, we talked about it uh, on the show uh, since last uh, Easter Jeep Safari, cause we wanted more people there and it, it worked out, but uh, it's so, it was so much fun. And we were uh, taking up a couple of tables at uh, the Moab diner every morning with uh, the yeah. Jeep talk show crew. And uh, so, yeah, we, we went, I think we went every day to the Moab diner. I was there from uh, Sunday. My wife and I were there from Sunday uh, afternoon uh, through Saturday morning. And, right. Uh, and you're right. Now, uh, a lot of people I've asked, I'll ask them, Hey, are you going to Easter Jeep Safari? No, no. Uh, I'll go to Moab, but I'll go when it's not Easter Jeep Safari because it's too busy. I don't see busy. Uh, I, I don't see that it's busy. And I'm wondering if they're talking about the, the actual uh, trails that the the Red Rock four wheelers uh, go on. I, I don't know if there's a limit to how many Jeeps they have in each each trip, but I could see how that yep. might, especially with the 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 the, uh, the the cameras and the stopping and the pictures and all that stuff. It could be very uh, uh, long uh, on a trail. Yeah. So with Jeep Safari, they have about thirty five ish guided trails that they offer. They don't all go out every single day, but every day there's probably at least fifteen trails. And then Big Saturday, there's probably almost 30 of the trails that go out. And based upon how difficult the trail is, usually the limit is a maximum of 40 vehicles, or the harder it gets, like if you get up to like doing Pritchett Canyon, you drop it down to maybe have a limit of only like 10 or 15 or 20 vehicles, you know, depending upon how many the the uh, trail leader is comfortable with. You know, I mean, my biggest trail that I ever guided was I had 44 vehicles that I took through Steelbender one year. And that's where you really rely on your gunners, your mid gunners, your tail gunners, CB communication to keep everybody moving and going through. Because it's it's a lot of work. But, you know, so you've got these trails you got to deal with. They're the official trails. And then you got other people that are running other trails, you know. And then when I was actually the land use officer was when we actually got our permit to be able to have exclusive use. So there are seven trails in Moab that we have exclusive use of that only Red Rock four-wheeler trail participants can go on during the day. And then there's three other trails that are only one way. So that way you don't have to worry about running into people going the other direction, trying to mitigate damage and passing and traffic issues and, and some things like that that have helped try to make the experience better for the paid participants. Now, if you want to go and not be involved with the Red Rock four-wheelers, 
just get the get the magazine and look and see what trails are doing what day and don't do those trails that day or go out and do some of the more scenic trails moab is so big and so expansive even during the busiest time of the, the year you can always go out and find seclusion if that's what you're looking for mm -hmm. you know i mean you could go out on hell's revenge and run into 500 vehicles or you could go out somewhere by you know off the gemini bridges road and see nobody all weekend you know it just depends on what you're looking for and what experience you're wanting yeah uh and this is the thing a lot of people don't understand and i, th I didn't understand it last year i got there and then uh, somebody had picked a uh, a camp uh, for us to to go to, and it was thirty one miles away from Moab, the city of Moab. And then then I was like, really? Because I've been to an off road park before, and and it wasn't thirty one miles away to camp someplace. I mean, it was a, it was a beautiful camping spot, but it, this is just all open land that you can go on. Not all of it, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, so right. that's one of the things I had to wrap, wrap my head around was it's just so freaking big. And here in yeah. Texas, we don't have uh, land like that available. Most of uh, Texas is fenced. Uh, I was surprised yeah. to find out. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So when, when people say, when you, you hear people say, it, no, I, don't like, I don't like to go to EJS because it's crowded, it's really not. And it is, it's just like David said, it depends on where you go. And if you want to, I like seeing the other Jeeps. I, I like seeing the other Jeeps go off road. And I remember we, I didn't do hell's revenge this year, but last year hell's revenge was pretty busy. Um, so, uh, I, I see what you mean, but that's, that's, it's really close to the Moab city. Maybe it's even in the Moab city, but it's very close by. I was surprised how close that was. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it really depends on the experience that you want. You know, for me, if you're going to go to Jeep Safari, part of the reason you go is to deal with all the crowds, to, to see the cool things, to go to the vendor show, to, to run into the different people, to experience that camaraderie that it's not just going Jeeping. Right. If you just want to go Jeeping, yeah, there's a lot of other times you can go that it's not going to be as busy, it's not going to be as expensive, it's not going to be as crowded. But if you go to Jeep Safari, you're going for the Jeep Safari experience. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the big draw of that week is what it is and what it is for the sport. Right. So do you do uh, do any other Jeep events uh, during the year? I do. So actually, the reason that I live out here in Hurricane, which, just side note, it's spelled Hurricane, but they pronounce it Hurricane because it was originally founded by the Welsh. So if you hear people say Hurricane, that's what ah. we're talking about is Hurricane Utah. We pronounce it Hurricane. Um, but so the reason I live out here is in 2016, there was a new event out here that was started called Trail Hero. And I came out to do it, and it's it's uh, actually the guy that's founded it is Little Rich Klein, who's been in the off-roading scene forever. His dad, Big Rich Klein, has been the guy in charge of We Rock for 20 years. You know, I mean, so they've got family history in this. So he started up this big event out here that really has incorporated a lot of the off-road scene. It's open to side-by-sides, ATVs, full-side Jeeps, buggies, I mean, whatever you want. And so I came out here in 2016 for the first trail year and just fell in love with the area. Because out here, we've got a huge area. It's about 65,000 acres that's open to cross-country travel. And so we have the opportunity to be able to go out and make new trails, to make new obstacles, to be able to challenge our vehicles as they're, the technology is getting better and vehicles and drivers are getting better. We're able to do more and harder things. Like in Moab, they have a 1 to 10 scale. And they've only got one trail that's a, I don't even know if Bridget's a nine or if it's still an eight. But, you know, basically they don't have anything really in terms of Jeep's right harder than about an eight or a nine. Out here, we rate our trails up to a 15. Because things out here are that much more difficult. You know, 15 is a trail that's never been completed by anybody. Wow. As soon as I ever completes it, it becomes a 14. As soon as three drivers completed, it becomes a 13. You know, I mean, this is stuff that, we're talking full-on moon buggy, rear steer buggies are struggling to get up. I mean, just insane obstacles. And so the opportunity you have out here, if you're really into the technical rock crawling, in my opinion, there's nowhere in the world better than Sand Hollow. And that's why I moved. And, and, and this would be one of the reasons why you're out there is because you've been doing this for a long time and you need the challenge. Yeah, I built my Jeep, basically my big CJ, to be able to do anything in Moab. And I've done every single trail in Moab from, you know, rear steer to upper El Dorado to Britney Spears and all the stuff out in area BFE to bridge it behind the rocks, Golden Spike. I mean, my Jeep can do all those pretty much on autopilot. 
<laughs> and so I didn't feel like I needed, I had a challenge anymore. Right. Coming out here, all of a sudden, it's like, now I need a buggy, you know? <laughs> because I got this buggy now that my Jeep couldn't do what I wanted to do out here. And so a couple of years ago, I bought a buggy. I still drive my green Jeep or my buggy, depending upon, you know, what I'm doing and where I want to go. And it, it's a whole different world in Sand Hollow. Interesting. It, it's like Moab is the bunny slopes compared to Sand Hollow. Yeah. I, I mean, I have not uh, done a lot of wheeling, but uh, when, you, when you go wheeling on 80 grit sandpaper, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not super challenging. I mean, some of it's still scary to me from the standpoint, I don't want to br- break my, uh, my gladiator. I don't want to damage it with any body damage or anything. I know, I know people are screaming at me, uh, but, uh, it, I'll blame it on the wife. Let's say that, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's fun. I mean, if I was doing it with somebody else or I had a, uh, a purpose built off-road vehicle, oh, I mean, especially if it was caged and, and I was strapped in and maybe had a helmet. Hell yeah. I mean, my God, that would be a blast. Just uh, yeah. balls to the walls. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, going fast and dangerous isn't isn't a problem to me, but damaging stuff that, uh, that I'm still paying for is. <laughs> All it takes is money, right? <laughs> so it, this is really funny. Uh, two interviews ago uh, was uh, Big Rich, uh, Rich Klein. So that's going to be coming out uh uh, uh, the, uh, shortly before yours does actually. And, uh, that was interesting. I was talking to uh, big rich, uh, while he was on his 48 foot boat in Port Aransas, uh, talking to me through a Starlink link. So we had, a, we had some fun talking about that stuff. Cause I'm a electronic, uh, interested person. Yeah. I should be competing with the We rock event coming up here in Cedar city at the end of April in my buggy. So I'm real excited about that. Yeah, so you can mention Jeep Talk Show to him, and he'll go, I know those people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I actually so, did Rich's um, podcast a few years ago, the one that he does on, you know, Talked with Big Rich. I did that. That was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a good guy. Um, yeah. So let me ask you about the, the Red Rock four-wheeler thing. What is the advantage to doing the Easter Jeep Safari with Red Rock four-wheelers? All right, this might be a time to pause it. Because... I can talk about my real experience with Red Rock, which isn't the most positive and one of the reasons I left Moab, or I can keep it more positive and tell the good things. But I I could say some not great things about Red Rock that are factual, but I don't know if you want to go negative or not. No, the only reason why I asked is if if there was any charitable stuff or any uh, uh, veteran stuff. I just wanted to throw that out there because I don't like like taking away from them and doing the EJS if they're doing things – good for people. Uh, we don't have to talk about that at all, especially. Yeah. Let me, let me give you an answer and you can tell me whether you like it or not. So, okay. So let's, let's take a pause so I can edit this part out. So just give me about five seconds and go right ahead. So one of the advantages of going out with the organized runs for Easter Jeep Safari, is they have what's called the mud fund, which is the most multiple use defense fund. And the idea is that that fund goes to help try to prevent trail closures or, you know, fight any land use battle that needs to be done. And so when you register for Red Rock Four Wheelers, a certain percentage of your registration fee goes into that mud fund. And it's a great concept. But in my opinion, I think Red Rock Four Wheelers could do more with that money. Um, There's a lot of people that are fighting to close down the trails in Moab. We even saw that last year with this new RMP that came out from the BLM. And Red Rock always kind of says, well, we're waiting for the big fight. We're waiting for the big battle. And the thing is, the the anti-access crowd isn't going to do a big battle. They're nickeling and diming us to death because they'll take 10 miles this year and 20 miles next year and 50 miles the year after that. They're not going to go after 1,000 miles in one year. They know that that's not going to work. And so the mud fund is a great idea, but I think Red Rock isn't spending it the most judicious way they could because they're waiting for a big battle that's never going to happen. Mm-hmm. Last year during the big, huge RMP thing, they gave like $20,000 to tread lightly. I'm sorry, but compared to what the Red Rock Formulas have in their mud fund, that's nothing. They could have contributed $200,000 if they wanted to and still been just fine. And so it's a good concept, but I wish Red Rock was doing more. And I had this argument with them the entire time that I was a land use officer. We need to be proactive. We need to fight every single inch or we're going to lose it all. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. It's it's silly to wait until it's too late is basically what it sounds like to me. 
But I was promised by the BLM director in Moab, we will never close down an Easter Jeep Safari trail. Now they are. Now there were three or four trails last year that were closed down in the RMP that have been traditional Easter Jeep Safari trails. And Red Rock's not standing up and fighting that the way that I think they should. And so that's disappointing to me. Yeah. Well, it, it's good information to have. Uh, and uh, and the reason for the question was I wanted to find out uh, what the advantage uh, to them. And there are advantages to to going there and using Red Rock four-wheeler. I mean, especially if you're not used to the area, at least they can uh, take you on the trails and, and help you along uh, with, uh, with what to do. Uh, but uh, yeah. but you don't have to. You can go on your own, or you can go as a group. Uh, especially if some members of your group are knowledgeable uh, about Moab, you can uh, make use of them. I mean, we used uh, Greg Henderson, who's been to um, uh, Eastern Jeep Safari many many times. So uh, it, it, Greg was there. It was so funny. You mentioned the the uranium thing. Uh, the Gone Jeeping group. I was invited to go with the Gone Jeeping group, which included uh, uh, Greg and the other members of of Gone Jeeping. And uh, we actually went to an old uranium mine. Uh, I think I think it was out Gemini Trails or something that you were mentioning. I, I, I need to find out exactly where that was for the show and the video I'll, I'll be putting up on YouTube. Uh, but uh, it was a lot of fun. Greg actually cr- climbed down a crack in the uh, the soil there and was uh, digging out petrified wood. And uh, he, yeah. he threw up a, a rock, and as he was throwing it up, he says, that's uranium ore. And it's like this guy caught it, and he says, how do you know? He says, it's heavy. <laughs> So it was very interesting getting out of the yeah. Jeeps and being at that old abandoned mine and uh, actually digging around in the soil. So there's so many things you can do uh, at, uh, at Moab and, of course, seeing the di- dinosaur bones, the dinosaur fi- footprints. And uh, we, uh, many of the members of the Jeep Talk Show group were out at um, the uh, uh, the Tread Lightly event on uh, Monday, uh, early Monday morning, to, to build fences and stuff. So. Uh, it was, it's a lot of fun. I, I really encourage everybody to go. I'm assuming you weren't at EJS this year. I'm not. I'm not been back to Jeep Safari since 2018. Um, a lot because of kind of some of my personal reasons. And I've kind of been there, done that. Right. You know, I'm, there's not a trail out there I haven't done a hundred times, you know. And, and so I've thought about going out for the camaraderie and the people and the vendor show and stuff like that. But it it's hard to justify the expense of paying, you know, Five thousand dollars to stay at a hotel for a week because, unfortunately, as my disability is progressing, camping is not a very feasible option for me. And so the the cost versus the benefit to me just right now isn't worth it. Well, and this is this is purely for me, so I'm not worried about you. <laughs> I would like for you to come out so I can see that van <laughs> once it's done, <laughs> and, and to meet you, of course. But that van, I think, I think it's out there. But my my counter to that is. Come out for trail heroes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just have a gladiator with a two inch lift, so uh, it, I'd, be I'd be in the parking lot. <laughs> the thing is, in out here in Sand Hollow, we've got everything. Like I said, up to a fifteen rated trail, but we also have a dozen trails that are between three and six. Oh, good. So you take the gladiator on. Yeah. You know, we've got great scenic trails out here. We've got a lot of sand. We've got some easier stuff. I mean, it's you could do it totally in a gladiator. We have plenty of people come out here in their gladiator, or their Cherokee, or their TJ, or whatever. So we're saying hollow is not all buggy stuff. Okay. There is all buggy stuff, but it's certainly not all buggy stuff. Well, I guess it's similar to, uh, to, to Moab, uh, that it's, uh, you can find stuff that's very difficult, but you don't have yeah. to go on it. And there's all often bypasses. So oh, but, very cool. Because out here it's open to cross country travel. If you've got a gnarly 10 rated obstacle in front of you, more than likely there's a way that you can go around that. And out here you can legally do that because it's open to cross-country travel, and so almost every major obstacle on a lot of the trails will have an easier go-around. Mm-hmm. Very, very cool. Great information. I appreciate you uh, answering the thing about the Red Rock four-wheelers. Uh, I did yeah. not know the the, de- the detail on it since I've, since uh, the Jeep Talk Show has never used them uh, uh, for, yeah. for Easter Jeep Safari. And we'll have to check out more information about uh, San Hollow. That sounds like a, a great place. So you know how the kids love the social media. How can people find you on social media? I don't even think I mentioned your Facebook page, which uh, yeah. I, I think that's a hilarious name, but I'll let you say it. So I've actually consolidated all of my social media. So I'm the same username on everything. I'm by far the most active on Facebook. I have an Instagram page that I cross post some of my Facebook stuff on. But I'm not really in, not real Instagram savvy. I do have a TikTok page I hardly ever use. I do have a YouTube page that I posted a few videos on, but all of them are the Gimpy Jeep guy. 
And so Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, if you go there and you type in the Gimpy Jeep guy, all one word, that's me. I got to say, I'm, I'm offended at that, the Gimpy Jeep. <laughs> <laughs> right. no, I've had no, I think that's, that's that's like yeah, that's that self-deprecation that so many of us love. You know, it's just like I'm not hiding anything here. <laughs> Take it or leave it. Damn it! <laughs> and if you know me, I'm not easily offended. You can call me just about anything you want to call me. You're not gonna hurt my feelings. It's like if I can't own it, who can? Oh you hell! Know? If if you're a friend with Greg Henderson, you can't have you can't be sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was told by my friends, if we don't make fun of you, we don't like you. Oh, absolutely. Fairly universal Jeep concept. Yeah. Well, it's a guy thing, too. Uh, yeah, and, right. we, and we pick on women, so it's an equal opportunity offender. Uh, David, thank you so much. A really, really interesting conversation. I know that we haven't even scratched the surface because you're you're a wealth of information. I appreciate you answering my questions and and maybe some cool. difficult questions uh, that uh, that you answered. And I appreciate you doing that too because we like learning things here. We like having fun and learning about Jeeps. And uh, uh, and now we know about that uh, that eleven thousand U.S. Postal uh, Fleet van that they were made and what happened with that. Uh, it just yeah. just a cool vehicle. I'm really looking forward to seeing that thing done and and you driving in it. Uh, I I still think that uh, having the the steering wheel in the middle and you roll in there with those so that tracked vehicle and you just uh, lock it in place and then you know press a button and then you're off. I think that would be really cool. But I certainly understand why you're going the direction you're going. And it's going to be like a brand new Jeep too because you got it's you know it's the Mahindra base. So uh, that'll be. It sounds like it'll have a lot of um, longevity to it. And uh, yeah. are you are you planning on driving that a lot, or is that just going to be special occasions? It'll be mostly my daily driver when when I get out and do things. I mean, I'm not working full time right now. I would, you know, I just did this book, which is hopefully going to give me a little bit of residual income. But it basically will be my daily driver and, and get out and be able to have that opportunity. And you know, some people give me a hard time. Oh, you're using stuff from India. It's not real Jeep stuff. But what a lot of people don't realize, and you may not even know this, is going back to 1947, Mahindra had a contract with Willys to be able to produce the Willys model internationally. Mm -hmm. so, and so they've actually got this huge history with Jeep. I mean, they've been basically making Jeep replica vehicles for 70 years. Yep. You know? uh, that's and, one of the reasons why I was really surprised that uh, Stellantis did what they did. Uh, I think they should have partner, partnered with them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's just kind of silly. And it's like, there's nobody that's going to be looking at a 60 to 70,000 JL and be like, oh no, I'm not going to buy that. I'm going to go buy a Fifteen thousand dollar rocks, sir. I mean, they're, they're not even in the same category. Right. But work together, I think it could have been beneficial for both. But well, well Jeep could have kicked the ass of the side by sides because if you can get a fifteen thousand dollar Jeep as opposed to a seventy eighty thousand dollar side by side, what is what are you going to go with? I mean, some people are still going to go with the side by sides. I'm glad you mentioned the book again. So, is the the book available? Or are you still working on it? Do you have a title? So the book is available on Amazon right now. Currently, you can get it digitally, or I just got approved my paperback copy. Hopefully, my hardback edition will be available this week. It's called It's a Jeep Thing, period, 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 The Life and Adventures of a Disabled Jeeper. Yeah. And, and so if you get you can either just type in It's a Jeep Thing book, or you can type in David Adams or the full name of the book, and it's available right there for purchase for download either through Kindle or you can get a physical copy of the book, but it is available and on online right now on Amazon. Very cool. We'll we'll include that link in the the show notes for this episode. Um, so uh, I, I have a name for a sequel. Uh, it's a Jeep okay. thing. Now it pees when I uh, now it burns when I pee. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Now I don't have any money in my wallet. Yeah, it's a Jeep <laughs> thing. My forever broke. Yeah. All right, David. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm glad you joined us. We'll have to have you on again very very soon. Thank you. I very much enjoyed it. And if you need anything else, feel free to reach out and hit me up on Facebook or whatever, and we'll talk. If I need a grill, I'll call you. <laughs> oh, I don't know. These are pretty special, you know. <laughs> All right. Have a good day. Hey, big thanks to David Adams for joining us here today. What a really interesting story. And uh, you can tell there's a lot more to the story. Uh, you're fortunate because uh, David has written a book. It's called It's a Jeep Thing, The Life and Adventures of a Disabled Jeeper. So uh, you can go right over to Amazon or just go to the show notes for this episode, and uh, there'll be a link in the show notes. Uh, oh, and don't forget to watch this uh, this uh, interview on our YouTube channel. It's really easy to find. Just go to YouTube.com and search for Jeep Talk Show. So until next time, uh, we will uh, uh, keep the, uh, what is it, keep the trail light on? I don't even know what that means. 
<laughs> need to write something down. Anyway, you guys have a great day and uh, be safe out there in your Jeep. Broadcasting since 2010. You're my friend. You're my new friend. <laughs>